Hi, everyone. Sorry for the technical delays. I'm super excited to have this chance to present. Uh, I love talking about games, and I love talking to, to you know, independent game creators. You know, I've, I've been on the creation side. I've been in the industry now for about 20 years myself. Uh, most of those years were on the creative side. I started and run a couple different game studios. Uh, the first was doing console games. The second was doing casual PC games. Uh, then I joined PopCap. I was a PopCap for a while doing mobile games, including mobile free-to-play games based out of out of China. And you know, over that time, uh, I've loved to see sort of just the way this industry has shifted. Uh, and now I'm at Microsoft. I started a company called PlayFab about six years ago. PlayFab was specifically trying to build sort of back-end solutions for games. And uh, it was a pretty incredible run. We got acquired by Microsoft two years ago. And now at Microsoft, I have a new title. My, I'm the general manager of a division called the Gaming Vertical, which is a very creative name for the group that's job is to sort of figure out how do we help support game creators around the world by providing services, not just PlayFab anymore, but PlayFab, Azure, a whole bunch of different things. So super exciting time. Uh, what I figured I would do today is talk a little bit about the future of games and sort of what I see the trends are, and then talk a little bit specifically about where PlayFab is going, where Microsoft's going, and then take some questions. So I can't see any hands or anything. So uh, if you have anything to say, just shout it out. Go, don't be afraid. Don't be shy to to raise your voice, and then we can we can take a pause. Um, but I will be taking questions after I get through my my kind of set of slides here. So I'm going to just start off by saying, what an incredible time to be in the game industry. You know, when I entered gaming 20 years ago, games were still kind of niche. I mean, people a lot of people played games, but you either had to have you know a decent powered PC or you had to have a console, which meant the number of gamers in the world was pretty small. Now, because every mobile phone is basically a game device, there are literally billions of gamers. And by our estimates, 2.6 billion gamers around the world. You know, their industry this year is on track to make about $170 billion of revenue globally. Uh, that's growing to $230 billion of revenue in, in the next five years, which is just kind of incredible numbers. I think when, you know, some people think we talk about gaming sort of for everyone, they think about this, at least in Microsoft, this is what we think about games for everyone means games that literally everyone can play, which often means things like our adaptive controller, which is designed so that you can play games even if you have sort of disabilities. Obviously, that's not what I mean. That's not what I think this group means. When we talk about games for everyone, I think we talk about this, you know, games that literally everyone can play. And, and if you look at, for example, you know, the recent growth of hyper casual games, which are even more sort of simpler and easy, easy to, to enter, um, we're really looking at just the sheer kind of breadth of what's out there. Now, obviously there's also, you know, high-end AAA games, you know, there's games like the new Flight Simulator, which Microsoft launched recently, which is sort of, is it a game? Is it a simulation? You know, what exactly is it? The fact is it's a pretty incredible experience and, and, and I'm really excited by sort of what now we're starting to see in the hybrid of not just kind of explosion of mobile devices, but the kind of incredible power of the cloud that we're now able to bring to, to creating these kinds of game experiences. Um, one thing that is interesting is as we've seen this explosion of sort of games for everyone, not everyone's always happy about it, you know, um, well, actually, I'll get that in a second. So, yeah, just looking at this, the sheer numbers here and looking at the growth, um, you know, it, it is incredible just how fast it's been growing. And it's also incredible to notice just how gaming um, is now the fastest growing. It, it, well, it's the sec it's the biggest entertainment sector other than TV advertising. Uh, and it is going to, it's growing so quickly, it will quickly become the biggest entertainment uh, uh, area. You know, bigger, of course, people love to say it's bigger than, you know, film combined with, you know, music and books, and it, it's it's just a huge industry. And and I really do think that gaming is becoming the new type of mass media. You know, I look at my kid, you know, who's seven, uh, when she plays games, you know, she still watches videos, but she also watches videos of people playing Roblox, she play, well, plays Roblox herself. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we all know, we're all here because in game, we recognize that the power of, of games. Um, I, I want to mention Gamergate briefly because I do think that even though it's not in the news these days, not everyone is thrilled to see the expansion of gaming. I think there's sometimes some people who believe, you know, that gaming is still um, something that they want to keep for themselves. But I really do believe that the the, the sort of most exciting opportunity we have in at Evis is that gaming is open for everyone. You know, and and it and it's such a big industry. There's lots of room to find, you know, your own space within it. One of the things that we we saw happening, which is frankly why I started PlayFab and, and why I'm most excited about my role within Microsoft today, is that games have really changed a lot over the last decades, you know, since really since I've been in gaming, but since I think many of you probably have as well. You know, it used to be games were purely products. You built them, you shipped them in a store, 
uh, and then you went and built a sequel. You know, and 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 back in this old model, games are pure products. Um, marketing was about selling games, and you had no connection with your customer once the game was out there. Obviously, games then became services. Many people would probably say we're still in the game and service space, where games are now services. And you build a game and you ship it, and then the hard work begins because now you have to operate your game post-launch. You have this opportunity to do this continual sort of engagement with your players. Um, you have this opportunity to communicate with your players. It's very kind of exciting. You can see what the players want. You can get feedback from them. I believe we're now in this new era of game as community, where the games have now become, and the most successful games have become community experiences where players are, you know, engaging not just because they enjoy playing the game, but this is really part of that, their their social life now. This is this is beyond just games like a hobby now, where you're really spending a, new, a major part of your life in this game. And in this new world, the opportunity for the game creator is to recognize that they're not like a movie director anymore. They're more like a cruise ship director or a nightclub empresario, where their job is to create the game as nightclub, where you're creating sort of opportunities for your players to have amazing experiences. And so, you know, it's almost like the player is now sitting at the design table alongside with you, you know, and, and you're kind of creating games with your players because you're sort of seeing what they're enjoying and you're really building in some cases for them. So it really has changed a lot this nature of what it is to be a game creator. Uh, and I think that's, you know, a lot of the tools we're going to talk about, a lot of things that we do at Microsoft or PlayFab does is aimed at helping enable this sort of new experience. So we talk about, you know, games community, it, it just changed the nature of gameplay, right? So, so games are no longer about just playing anymore. Again, you know, there's so many more verbs involved in the experience of playing a game. Now you're playing, you're also chatting, you're watching other people play, you're competing, you're buying, you're creating, and, and many more. So you have this much more nuanced now view now of what it is to be a game. Fortnite, obviously, you know, I think is one of the kind of biggest game experiences out there. Ultimate example of a game is a community. Um, you know, when we, I think the, the the Marshmallow concert that you know is now famously broadcast live inside of Fortnite, we're gonna look back in the history books and say, wow, that was really a moment when games really fundamentally changed. This notion of a game is now a community platform is now an opportunity for a live DJ concert is amazing. And and frankly, we're starting to see game engines now used in some really really interesting ways. Uh, but I'll get to that in a, in a second. So you look at the top 10 grossing games. This is a slightly old slide, but you know, if you look at from 19, 20, 2017 to 2018, 90% of the top 10 games from 2017 were the same games in 2018. And that's really because um, these are these are now communities. You know, these are not games that you play for 12 hours and you're finished. These are games that you're playing and you're engaging with on a continual basis. And so obviously this is about live ops. This is about now as a game creator, you need to really be thinking about what am I going to do after I launch my game? And it's almost like, how am I going to build my game to give me opportunities to have really amazing opportunity, you know, live ops experiences and, and, and to really continually engage with my players. And so when we talk about live ops, we break it down. We talk a lot about live ops. In fact, I've got a, I'll give a, a, a totally self-serving plug here. I've got a podcast called the art of live ops that if anyone's interested, I would encourage you to check out. We're up to season two now. I think we've got something like 30 episodes out. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun putting that, that podcast together, but that's talk about it later. So what is live ops? Two things, live and ops, right? Live is really talking about a live game and the idea that your game is connected to the internet. Your game is, you have the ability to update it and change it, uh, gather data from it. Uh, it's live. Uh, but live alone is not really the whole picture. The ops part is the interesting part where you're continually investing in your game. You're continually changing it. You have to have a team to do that. And, and actually, actually the live op, op, the ops part is where we see the most culture change. And it often takes game studios, you know, who are used to just building packaged goods, you know, four or five years to get in the mindset. So if you're a new game creator, you're just starting out, you're in a new studio. If you're already thinking that, hey, from my very first game will be a service that I'm running and I'm going to be changing and trying to create a community of players, then you're, you're already ahead of the game. Our vision at Microsoft for what these live ops games look like, you know, our vision is that we are creating services. And PlayFab is a collection of services that you can use in your game to do a lot of these things. You know, we have services for chatting and competing and buying and all the different things you might want to do inside your game. As your, your players are playing your game, they're continually throwing off data about what they're doing. We give you opportunity to capture that data, generate insights from it, and then in real time, use the data to push changes back into your game and actually change the game experience on the fly based on what you see your player doing. 
And so this is sort of our vision of where modern live ops is going. doesn't mean everyone has to do this from the very beginning. You know, this is something that we, these are capabilities that we want to have there for when you're ready for them. But we do think this is really the kind of a very exciting time in gaming because you are able to start changing experiences on a player by player basis. Not every player has to have the same experience and that's okay. Um, if you look at sort of business wise, you know, free to play games is now 70% of the total industry revenue. This is very much where the model's going. You know, mobile 72 is, is more than almost half of the total revenue by segment. And I think it's probably growing. So this really is just, just showing how, how the space has shifted. Um, so another reason why it's an amazing time to be a game creator is not only is sort of this new opportunity to create games there, but the tools you need to use to build the games themselves, you know, have really become democratized. And Unity loves to say democratize, you know, that they've democratized game development. But I would almost argue that things like Roblox are going even farther, you know, in, in creating the next generation of, of, of game creators. You know, I look at Roblox and um, they're actually, we're, we're partners with them. Microsoft PlayFab powers the analytics experience inside of Roblox. And so we've got a chance to look at, at that platform. And you know, some of the top, I would say the top 10 games on Roblox, just based on traffic, are probably top maybe 20 or 30 or 40 games globally. I mean, these are big games with you know tens of millions of players. The fact that they happen to live within Roblox is almost like a, a, a distraction. These are real games with 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 full. You know, I, I played some of the games with my kid. These are full on, complicated, sophisticated MMOs. Um, and it's really interesting to see that shift. The other shift I was starting to talk about is how game engines are starting to be used now outside of gaming. And I don't know if anyone saw the live action, or not live action, the recent uh, remake of The Lion King by Disney. Um, you know, it was a you know CGI film. What people maybe didn't realize, if you haven't, you should go and look into this, is how they actually used a VR and uh, Unreal Engine to actually help. Actually, I think they used uh, Unity to help create the game itself. So they actually um, shot the film using cameras uh, in a VR experience. So they basically gave the cameraman, uh, they basically created the environment and they put virtual cameras in the virtual environment and they were basically shooting the, the, the film using real world cameras, shooting actors on a set. Only the actors weren't on a set, they were actually inside, inside you know, the game engine. And so using game engines now is not just previs for, for real films, but sort of to capture the films themselves is phenomenal. And, and The Mandalorian got a lot of notoriety recently also. The Mandalorian is using virtual backdrops where the actual walls of the of the of the set are no longer blue green screens or blue screens. They're actually LED walls projecting live imagery from Unreal, where the camera has motion tracking on it, and as the camera moves around, the backdrops are moving around. So, game engines being used as part of game production is fascinating. Another thing I think we're starting to see is you know the games from Red Dead Redemption. The game worlds we're building just keep getting bigger and bigger. You know, uh, this is a huge game world, a flight simulator from Microsoft, the newest one you're flying around literally the world. We've taken Bing map data and we've used machine learn learning to basically expand that into an actual 3D geometries where you now really are exploring the actual real world, which is pretty phenomenal. I actually think that we're gonna to start to see almost like this, this split between people who create worlds and people who create games where these game worlds start to become more and more open where you can create your own games inside worlds from other games. And I'm sort of waiting for that trend to happen because I also think that you know, again, going back to, to, to Roblox for a second, you know, games are also becoming platforms. I talk about game as community, there's also game as platform, where you've built this game and now other people are creating games inside your game. We've had that with mods, of course, for a long time, but I think, you know, we're starting to see even, even new opportunities. I, I, I have a slide to rest world here because in my mind, this notion of creating worlds and then letting other people create stories in your world, this reminds me very much of, of what we're seeing in rest world. Of course, we have game streaming coming. You know, I, I made this out a couple a little while ago. Stadia versus X Cloud. Now, uh, just yesterday, Amazon announced. Uh, I think it's Project Luna. I think it's called their streaming service. Interesting to see what streaming is going to do for gaming. Um, I personally think that streaming is um, sort of like an extension of the console. It's a new way to experience content. In, you can do it in your mobile phone. I don't know that it's going to necessarily change things that much, but I could be wrong. You know, one of the things that's neat about game streaming in the cloud is that now, of course, you're running the game in the cloud versus on your local desktop. And that means a couple of things. It means it's easier to get lots of players together in one space. So if you want to have 100,000 players in a single server or in a single game experience, it's hard to do if the, it's also all happening on 100,000 PCs out in the world. But if those 100,000 cores are all sitting in the same data center where you've got really fast connectivity between them, it's a lot easier to think about potentially keeping all that data in sync. Um, we're also seeing, one of the things we are seeing is a lot of this game streaming technology is actually being used for applications 
other than playing games. Like for example, um, uh, you, Unreal has something they call pixel streaming as one of the features of their engine, where if you are a architect, let's say, and you've built a building in Unreal and you want your client to be able to walk through that building uh, you know, in real time, beautiful 3D with ray tracing, you don't always know that your clients are gonna have high-end gaming PCs and their desktops. And so you wanna be able to actually run that experience in the cloud and send your client uh, a URL on a web browser so your client can walk around this beautiful rendered building in Unreal in any web browser anywhere in the world because all the processing is happening in, this, in the cloud. And so I think a lot of the same technology that's gonna unlock things like Stadia and xCloud are also gonna unlock a whole bunch of new 3D experiences which are gonna be pretty, pretty phenomenal. I talked about Roblox a few times. You know, I, I do think you know just the sheer variety of content that's out there. You know, this is like the YouTube of gaming now, right? You know, that there's so many games out there, and, and traditional 3D, traditional AAA developers look at these and say, "Oh, it's not really a game anymore." But ab absolutely, these are games. If you look at the kids who are playing these, they take these just as seriously as we take our you know AAA Xbox games or whatever. Um, we also look at, for example, in Minecraft, the way that as part of being kind of a game as a service now. Game creators can create their own content and upload it. Uh, modern games are marketplaces, and you know one of the neat things about you know we, we, a lot of this, this technology, Minecraft actually is powered by PlayFab. Uh, when 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 the flight simulator launched uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, it launches with a marketplace also, same exact marketplace technology built for Minecraft, also powering the marketplace in Flight Simulator, and that's technology that we're actually gonna be bringing to PlayFab in the near future, which is pretty cool. So yeah, I love the ability to sort of open up and make that technology available to, to, to everyone. You know, another kind of feature of gaming, you know, a lot of buzz, has been a lot of buzz around sort of, you know, cryptocurrencies and our cryptocurrencies coming to gaming. You know, we have off-the-shelf blockchain technology. I'm a little bit less bullish on some of these technologies. I don't know that you necessarily need to have blockchain to have the kinds of experiences they're creating, but I do think it's interesting that people are trying. Um, I think VR and, and is, is finally starting to uh, uh, to grow. Although I do think augmented reality is in some ways hotter than virtual reality. Um, you know, we had our Minecraft Earth experience. If you haven't seen that, it's kind of interesting. Um, it hasn't maybe gotten the traction that we thought it might, but it's been interesting to say it was, a, it was a great experiment in using Minecraft to build real world experiences using things like um, Azure uh, 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 mixed reality anchors to basically take video from the real world and anchor them in, in, in augmented reality. It's, it's pretty cool. It was a pretty cool project. And, and, and I do think that there's a lot of opportunity for sort of in the world, real world uh, games that um, are, are fixed to location, you know, exploration and, and, and real world exploration. So um, finally, kind of wrapping up a little bit, you know, we talked a lot about live ops. Uh, Satya, CEO, loves this concept of live ops. And he likes to say that we're going to start seeing live ops outside of gaming in uh, in enterprise, enterprise live ops, you know this idea that every application you have to kind of once you launch it, continue to operate it and do things with it. And we actually are seeing parts of our company using, for example, PlayFab for things like healthcare applications, uh, where you want to be able to kind of engage with your consumers and make it a more a more entertaining experience. Um, another, I think it's really my final kind of point here is uh, we're also seeing machine learning being used now throughout the whole game cycle. And you know, I look at, for example, build, test, launch, and operate. You know, again, I keep talking about this, the uh, the flight, flight simulator experience. You know, the way that worked is they took, they, they were, they, it's coming like a black shark out of, I believe, uh, Europe. They basically took the the satellite imagery and built the models to turn that into the physical geometry you're flying around. And I, and I love that. We've also done applications where, you know, we're able to take, for example, textures and use machine learning models to take those textures, shrink them down super small, and then at runtime, reproduce the original high fidelity textures uh, so that what you're seeing in game look like high fidelity, high resolution textures, but what we actually shipped in the, in, over the, over the, the internet are much smaller. And we're actually using machine learning models to expand them at real, at runtime, which is pretty amazing. Um, I'm definitely thinking a lot about, and we're looking at where machine learning can help out with things like live ops, uh, everything from making recommendations, changing pricing, looking for toxicity, fraud detection. These are all, uh, opportunities that we're, we're exploring on, on our side. So final thing, I did start this talk by announcing I have, a, I have a new role. My title now is general manager of the, the gaming industry for Microsoft. So you know, my role is to think about um, sort of how we can, as a company spanning all of Microsoft, help game creators be, you know, achieve more, which is one of our kind of company mission statements. And so one of the ways in which we, we do that within uh, um, the game space is to look at um, 
is to basically look at these kind of, we call them industry priority scenarios, which are basically scenarios that we believe game developers care about. So we think game developers care about, uh, so these are the five things we've come up with. That, and so you're gonna see us over the next several years really investing heavily against these. So you're gonna see us investing to help bring game production to the cloud, because we think you know COVID was sort of no, notable for this. A lot of people now are working from home, including myself. You know, So helping bring your game production to the cloud obviously helps with that. But there's also reasons to do it that have nothing to do with working from home that have to do with accelerating production. So when all of your data lives in the cloud, it becomes a lot easier to build your game. Uh, and there's a lot of cool things you can do than if it's all distributed across a lot of, of you know, PCs in your office. Helping create effective communities, um, multiplayer, and, and we talked about the, the community, importance of community already. So providing technologies to help with that end-to-end -end community, whether it's multiplayer or whether it is toxicity detection or looking for harassing behavior, creating effective communities is, is, is important. We talk about the importance of knowing your player, you know, being able to gather all that data, understand who they are, and then be able to use that to, to change behaviors. Growing a player lifetime value. So the reason why you do a lot of the live ops activities we talked about is to grow your player lifetime value, to basically make more money from your players over time. And, and you do that not, it's not just about boosting monetization of individual players, it's also about boosting retention. So keeping players longer, reducing your churn, making them these sort of ever-growing experiences uh, is really, I think, one of the goals of all players. And then finally, helping acquire new players. Obviously, games need players to survive. Uh, and so what can you do to help with that kind of player acquisition process? So that's our gaming vertical. That's what my team looks at. And how can we create these across the whole company? So not just Game Pass, um, not just Azure, but even things like Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Office. You know, What are the technologies we can bring to, to, to the industry, the gaming industry, to help you out in your job? So we have... Um, just to kind of close it up then, you know, there's a bunch of technologies we have. We call it Microsoft Game Stack. You know, we, PlayFab is, I think, the focus of, of today's Game Jam a little bit. Uh, I am really excited to see what you do with PlayFab. I know one of the fun features of PlayFab that we've talked about encouraging you to try out today is something called Azure Functions or, well, Azure Functions. We used to have a feature called Cloud Script, where you can basically run scripts inside your game that you wrote in JavaScript. Uh, we've since realized that, that Azure Functions are way more powerful. And so we've sort of made, we're in the process of sort of deprecating that cloud script feature and saying, look, just use Azure functions. And then we can call them from, make it really easy to call them from within, within PlayFab, within your game. And the reason I love Azure functions is they're basically serverless. You don't have to staff up and build and pay for game servers in the cloud to run the game. You really are just paying for these individual functions, which are very efficient. And so as you think about this game jam, as you think about using functions, I want to encourage you to think about what are some ways you can create really cool player experiences uh, that don't require servers. That can be completely serverless, just using the sort of server server based logic through through Azure Functions, which I think are really cool. And so with that, um, I'm going to wrap it up. So I want to sort of thank you for giving me this this chance to chat. All right, then I'm going to drop off, and I'll be in the Azure. I'll be in the support group for the next half hour, and uh, I'm happy to chat with people there. Okay, thank you, James, and Bye, good luck everyone. to everybody.